uh, what a wonderful audience and a uh, great mix of students and community folks and, and even a few professors. It's hard to get professors to come back out tonight, but thank you for coming tonight. Uh, I'm David Skidmore, and I'm director of the Principal Financial Group Center for Global Citizenship uh, and of the um, Drake's Global and Comparative Public Health Concentration, both of which are sponsoring tonight's events. Those of you who are students, if you haven't looked into our Global and Comparative Public Health Concentration, I hope you, you will. You can find information about it on, on the web. It's, uh, it, it might be uh, just the right addition to, to whatever your major is. Um, this is actually National Public Health Week, which is one reason why we decided to, to try to schedule an event. And uh, um, we, we certainly picked a, a, a topic and a speaker who are timely and uh, in the news. Um, it shouldn't be that controversial to advocate and, and to work on behalf of clean water. And yet sometimes it turns out it, it is because um, clean water is, uh, is, is not something, well, there, there are, it's, sometimes uh, there are costs involved in, in keeping our water clean. The question is who, who will sort those costs. And tonight we have Bill Stowe with us, who is the head of the Des Moines Water Works. Um, I send Bill uh, a, t a little check every month to, to get my clean <laughs> water, and I, I'm happy to do it. Uh, but um, Bill is a public servant, and he takes very seriously that role as an advocate for the public good. And uh, as I said, sometimes that, that's controversial, but Bill's been willing to, um, to to take on controversy when it is in the uh, he sees it in the public interest to so advocate for uh, for clean water in particular. So we're going to hear a little bit about uh, some of the issues here in, in Iowa, but it's not just an Iowa problem; it's a national problem. Absolutely. Uh, we've heard about some of the issues in Flint, Michigan, but it's not just a Flint problem. Uh, we've we've since uh, uh, the media has begun to pay attention to this issue; they're finding more and more water problems uh, in cities around the country. So, um, I want, I'd like you to join me in welcoming Bill, and thank you Bill for coming and joining us. Thank you. Thank you. thank you very much for giving up a beautiful night to be inside and listening to me. It is terrific out there. Um, because we have videographers, I'm going to try and do what's very natural for me and stay right here so they don't have to try to follow me. I'm going to talk for 40 minutes or so. Uh, first of all, David, thank you for the invitation to be here. I'll talk for about 40 minutes or so. During that 40 minutes of me talking, uh, when I hit a nerve with you or raise some kind of question, feel free to jump in, but at the end I'll ask for a question. I worked for the Des Moines City Council in a prior role before I came to Waterworks for many years. I've never given a presentation without being interrupted, so it's not a matter of comity or politeness or civility. If you've got a question or if I've said something that offends you, feel free to jump in there. We'll be happy to mix it up. Um, I do want to show you a brief video that we put together in the last few months that I think is pretty good on the water quality issue. I'll show it in just a second. Let me tell you the three points that I want you to walk out of here with an appreciation that what David mentioned is National Public Health Week. Water is a unique commodity. I've worked in utility businesses for many years, worked for an electric and natural gas utility, worked for a large petrochemical processor. Utilities are pretty important to us. They're often monopolies, heavily regulated uh, for economic reasons. We're heavily regulated not only for economic reasons, but for public health reasons. But water, unlike electricity or telecommunications, or natural gas is something that you internally uh, ingest and it is absolutely critical for your health. That's a little bit different than an electron or a molecule of methane or propane or whatever it may be uh, in another utility. We are very different in that regard. So water, very much uh, unique and vital public health commodity. And we produce water. Um, water quality is in crisis in this state, and I'll talk a little bit more about that and what that particularly means and why that's the case. But water quality in an area like ours, 
which uses surface water, rivers, lakes, streams, to draw our drinking water from. Water quality is driven by human activity on the land within the watershed. Don't want to get into too much hydrogeology, but I think you have a sense of watershed. Here, we're part of the Des Moines and Raccoon River watersheds, and the water quality in the Des Moines and Raccoon Rivers is driven overwhelmingly by farming. Uh, 10,000 square miles of land upstream from us in the Des Moines and Raccoon River, which are contributors to the Mississippi River Valley. Uh, farming in a lot of different forms, row crops and, and confined animal feeding operations drive our water quality. It's not about what your parents do or what you do on your suburban or urban lawn. It's not about wastewater treatment plants for the most part. It's about agriculture. So that's part of the reason that when I speak on water quality, it's pretty controversial because Iowa is a fifth generation of Iowan is an egg state and sees itself as always being an egg state. Well, got news for you, California is an egg state also. Wisconsin is an ag state, and their state's Minnesota, with a high environmental ethic that goes with agriculture that we don't have in this state. And that's the rub in our discussions about water quality and agricultural accountability. That's not a sentence that works together, concepts that works uh, very well in Iowa. So public health, water quality for surface water driven primarily by agricultural activities. Although I'm going to talk heavily about nitrate pollution. We've been talking about nitrate pollution in Des Moines Water Works for 25 years. We have allegedly the world's largest uh, nitrate removal facility not very far from us down by the airport. Um, if we were talking 25 years from now, we'll probably be talking about something else, hopefully other than nitrate pollution. But surface water quality in this state 25 years from now will be driven by agricultural activities too more likely than not. Decent film, I'm gonna show it's about six minutes. That'll take a little bit more time than I'd want to do, but I think it's pretty good at framing the issue. So now, David has tried to instruct me. I'm gonna try it here, David. Uh, I'm not an Apple person. Ooh, you know, I'm an engineer. Apples are for accountants, or lawyers, or political scientists. Uh, we're gonna try this. See if I can blow it up. Whoa, it goes. Hopefully you can hear it. Clean, safe drinking water. Right from the tap, we don't think about it. Yet our lives depend on it. Des Moines Water Works does think about it, a lot. Because over 500,000 people in Des Moines and the surrounding area depend on it always being there. This means we're acutely aware of the quality of our water sources and the increasing pollution in Iowa's waterways. Water pollution affects more than just your drinking water. It also impacts recreation wildlife and business far beyond the Des Moines area. The source water for the Des Moines Water Works, the Des Moines and Raccoon Rivers, are part of a system called a watershed. As rain and snow melt shed off and through the land, tiny streamlets become creeks and flow into streams and finally rivers and lakes. Water also moves into lakes and rivers within a watershed via groundwater and agricultural tile drains. If there are pollutants on the land or in the ground, they can get picked up by the water and carried into the watershed. Unfortunately, this is exactly what's happening in Iowa. As of 2015, over 700 Iowa rivers, streams, and lakes were found to be impaired with various pollutants at unsafe levels. The Des Moines and Raccoon River watersheds are just a small part of our planet's vast water system, but they contribute significant amounts of pollutants that affect water quality and the life that depends on it, all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. The first of the three major pollutants in Iowa is eroded soil. High soil concentrations, runoff from farm fields and urban construction sites, block sunlight and limit the growth of oxygen-producing plants. The water also absorbs more heat. Warmer water holds less oxygen. As the soil settles, it fills in lakes and streams. The overall result is less oxygen and habitat for aquatic animals and plants. Bacteria comes primarily from feedlot runoff, 
Overflowing or malfunctioning manure storage tanks and lagoons, too much livestock waste spread on farm fields, and leaky septic tanks. Irresponsible dog owners also contribute. All of this gets washed into the watershed, making the water in our lakes and rivers unsafe to drink or sometimes even swim in, especially during times of heavy rains. Soil and bacteria, harmful as they are, are relatively easy to remove from the water. It's a different story regarding excess nutrients or fertilizers. Adding nutrients to the soil helps us feed the world's growing population and nourishes urban landscapes. But when more is applied than can be used up by the plants, the remainder ends up in our rivers and lakes. Tile lines under farm fields designed to improve conditions for growing crops unfortunately channel excess nutrients directly into our rivers. Urban streets and storm sewers do likewise. High nutrient levels in our lakes and rivers lead to excess algae growth. Algae deplete oxygen levels, harming aquatic life, and sometimes release toxins harmful to all life. Some of the excess nutrients get converted into nitrate by bacteria in the soil. If infants younger than six months of age drink water containing over 10 milligrams per liter of nitrate, the maximum allowed by the Safe Drinking Water Act, their blood can lose the ability to transport oxygen, causing sickness and even death. This condition is commonly called blue baby syndrome. Researchers are also studying high nitrate impacts on the general population. In the late 1980s, as nitrate levels in Iowa's waterways began rising, Des Moines Water Works began designing a nitrate removal facility. Built in 1992, it is one of the world's largest denitrification facilities, and it's seen increasing use over the years. In 2015, Des Moines Water Works had to run the facility for a record 177 days at a cost of four to seven thousand dollars a day. Altogether, various nitrate mitigation efforts added up to $1.5 million in 2015. All water flows to the seas. The pollution it carries flows too. Excessive nutrients are creating an expanding dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. Soil, bacteria, and other pollutants in the water ultimately harm all life on the planet in ways we know and in ways we may yet discover. More Iowa farmers can join those planting buffer strips, saturated buffer strips, and cover crops that retain nutrients and topsoil, and practicing wise controlled use of fertilizers. Agricultural drainage also needs to be regulated, just like urban storm and sanitary sewer systems. Urbanites can practice smarter landscaping using native species that require less maintenance, keeping loose soil cover, and even picking up dog waste. Des Moines Water Works will continue to do its part, providing safe, clean drinking water for half a million customers in Central Iowa in a way that's effective and cost-efficient and planning how to keep it just as clean or cleaner for more and more people in the future. Hopefully, you see that you have a part to play too. We all need to take responsibility for making our water safer for drinking and recreation. To learn more, Visit dmww.com and click on Water Quality. Doing what you can helps you, helps everyone, now and especially in the future. Remember, think downstream. Decent film? Pretty good in a lot of ways in getting some ideas across. Now let's see if David got the idea across to me about how to pull this stuff. Am I right to click? We'll find out. Oops, you know. Sorry, I'm sure you have better students normally than me. This whole Apple thing throws me way off. There we go. I'm going to put that there. I'm going to talk a little bit more probably than you want me to about science, just because it's pretty critical to our public policy discussion. I'm going to talk about our business because we are a business, you know, we don't do this for free, we don't give away water for free, and many of our concerns are economic. I've talked about policy also, 
And I'm going to start taking questions in about 20 minutes. Um, so I'll try to go through this pretty quickly. Water is such a fascinating uh, compound. The polarity of that atom, or that molecule that you see, the H2O molecule, is pretty important in understanding what goes on with water quality. Water is a solvent, and when it has contact with other compounds, solutes, it assumes some of the chemical characteristics because of this polarity, because of the pluses and minuses within the molecule. It drives water quality issues because that contact assumes some of the characteristics of things that it comes in contact with. Our business is pretty straightforward. We produce drinking water for a half million islands. We're called Des Moines Water Works, but really more accurately, we should be called Central Iowa Water Works. Our business was founded right after the Civil War by familiar Des Moines names like Hubble and like Polk. Uh, pretty important folks realized that there was a business opportunity and ran it as a for-profit business until about 100 years ago when they got into a row and dispute with the city of Des Moines about CEO pay and uh, uh, building new resources and water rates and the city of Des Moines uh, municipalized it, uh, took it over at a cost that was, became the subject of some litigation. But for the last 100 years, Des Moines Water Works has been run by five trustees who were appointed by Mayor County uh, the mayor of Des Moines, but rea in reality, we have more customers outside of the city of Des Moines than we have in Des Moines, although we have more revenue in Des Moines, which is a longer story for a longer discussion, but you get the idea of a business model that's a little different. We serve the four counties you see here. The white areas are areas we do not serve, like to our south and to our east, the city of Indianola in the middle of Warren County, um, the city of um, Winterset in the middle of Madison County, most of Polk County, most of Dallas County. They're not necessarily a direct customer. They don't get a bill if you live out in rural Dallas County that says Des Moines Water Works at the top. You get one that says Xenia Water, but we produce the water that they then sell and distribute. Pretty complicated arrangement, seemingly, but one that works pretty well. Uh, it's a growing part of the state, so we're fortunate to have a market that continues to grow, although water consumption for us as individuals actually is going down. Long story there, but basically smart technologies, low flow toilets, mean you and I used less water in 2016 than we did, in, for those of you who may have been alive, then in 1986. Um, and the business that we support in the metro has changed very much. They're not tire companies and implement manufacturers, they're IT companies. And IT, like server farms from Microsoft to our south here at the Des Moines West Des Moines border, or Facebook to our northeast, they're very efficient water users. They recycle most of their water, except uh, on very hot days. The water is used for HVAC for cooling purposes, and they have to dump it at some point when it's 90 degrees and the humidity approaches 90%. They have to dump it and immediately demand a whole lot of water. That's very different than base load industrial manufacturers like John Deere with day after day after day after day there's a lot of water. So our business model has changed quite a bit to be able to meet customer demands. We have urban customers, obviously. You would be urban customers, at least superficially sitting in the middle of Des Moines. A lot of suburban customers. We have rural customers. We have a lot of livestock producers in the southern portion of our service territory in Warren and Madison County and certainly in Dallas County, a few in Polk County. Our system is pretty big, uh, a lot of pipes, a lot of plants to be able to support that. About 1,400 miles of pipe, which by Iowa standard is a lot of pipe. We have three plants, three water producing plants that take water essentially from the river. Uh, that's very much the case at Fleur Drive. If you go to the airport, our big plant, 75 million gallons of water produced a day. We open up a big gate right on the Raccoon River, and the Raccoon River water comes into our plant through a pipe. Um, that technology that we use at Fluor Drive and the technology we use to our southwest down at Maffet Reservoir, people know Maffet Reservoir. Moffat is what the media calls it, but it's an A, not an O. And Dale Maffet uh, had my job and did it a lot better than I'll ever do it about 100 years ago. Uh, named after him. 
those two plants produce about 100 million gallons put together each year, and they use, or each day, excuse me, and they use a technology called lime softening, more chemistry than you want, but it's basically a process of adding chemicals, coagulating out a whole bunch of stuff, killing by changing the pH in the water to kill microorganisms. It doesn't do anything for nutrient pollution or fertilizers like nitrogen, like phosphorus that are in our water sources because of upstream agricultural pollution. That process requires a whole different method of removing uh, nutrients through ionization. You saw those big green tanks and a little discussion on the film about that. That technology is now 25 years old. We're using it more often than we ever have, and so it's wearing out. If the new norm is the kind of nitrate pollution that we're seeing in our rivers, we're going to have to replace that. We're going to have to replace that with your money. Huge dollar uh, uh, infrastructure investment, about $80 million just to fund the debt on that for 20 years will mean your rates will compound upward 10% for debt service only for the 20 years. So that's a lot of money and something we want to avoid, which is part of our business case for saying, stop the pollution upstream. It's costing us money and it's risking, realistically, our ability to meet that health obligation. And the health obligation is to remove nitrates down to 10 parts per million. It's a particular risk to infants, as you saw also in the film. One thing that I'll mention here that's just a, you know, kind of interesting, probably, to those of you who like science, you think of water towers and standpipes in neighborhoods, a lot of them around the metro area. They're for storage, and they're also for regulating hydraulic pressure. So when you turn the tap in your house, you got a lot of pressure there. It's the difference in elevation between that water tower and your house pushes the water through gravity without having to pump it. Um, storage is pretty important to us because today we'll sell 50 million gallons of water. If we were having this discussion at the beginning of next semester, we'll say September, August, we'd sell twice that amount of water, 100 million gallons, for a very seasonal utility. You irrigate more, uh, we're involved in more car washes and other uses in the summer than we are in the spring and in the winter. Storage is pretty important to us because utilities have to base their investment on peaks, not on averages. Um, you know, on average, if you put your head in the oven and your feet in at the freezer, you're comfortable. That isn't life. You're really not comfortable. We have to deal with the peaks, and that's the peak that we need to deal with is the prospect that you'll use 100 million gallons July 4th, as an example. So to do that, storage is very important to us. The storage we're turning to now this is the science, is back in the aquifer. We don't take water from the aquifer, but we actually deposit water in the aquifer. Aquifer is the rock geological formation that in our case here, in this part of Iowa, is about 2,000 feet beneath us. Some cities, West Des Moines is an example, takes a portion of their drinking water they don't buy from us, from the aquifer, Altoona from the aquifer. When you hear about uh, water shortage problems in California, that's because of aquifer problems, trying to take it from the groundwater, not the surface water, but the groundwater 2,000 feet beneath us here. We'll produce water today, that is off-peak, in days when we've got a lot of plant capacity. We'll produce it, and we will pump it down into the aquifer and store it 2,000 feet and bring it back up on July 4th when we need it. Fascinating technology. Um, worth a discussion for those of you who are geologists offline sometimes. Des Moines Waterworks, one of my predecessors, L.D. McMullen, uh, was a leader in introducing that technology here in Iowa. But very important to us as we have these unusual water consumers like Microsoft that will use no more water than this building 364 days a year, but on one day when it's really hot and really humid, they want 6 million gallons of water. On the same day when most of you aggregately want 100 million gallons of water. So they're a peak on a peak for us. Very different business model than Firestone or John Deere. Okay, let's talk a little policy. This is what my family thinks Iowa looks like. My adopted family, my non-Iowa-based family, because they watch CNN or whatever, Fox. I'll try to be uh, equally Republican and Democratic uh, in my 
discussion tonight. That's what they think of. You know, they hear the caucuses, they see Terry Branson or Joni Ernst or whomever uh, interviewed about the caucuses, and that's usually a backdrop. Uh, pretty exciting stuff. But in my business, this is really the Iowa that we think of. This is called a harmful algal bloom, a blue green algae mass that's in our service territory. This is actually in a lake. Uh, just to our north, but this is indicative of a nutrient problem, a phosphorus problem primarily. But that blue-green algae just isn't yucky, and it creates a toxin, a toxin that's very difficult for us to deal with. Fortunately, as I've told you several times now, we take our water from the rivers, not from the lakes. Um, that's material because algae forms in standing water and pool water, not in moving water, or not as easily in moving so we don't have an algae problem here like my colleagues would in Toledo, Ohio, as an example, on Lake Erie or in Chicago, where they're drawing from Lake Michigan. Uh, this is a huge emerging problem for people in the north, particularly in the Great Lakes states. You'll hear more about harmful algal blooms. I mentioned that we're in a water crisis uh, in Iowa, a water quality crisis in Iowa. And there are three things that I'll point to. Some of them were mentioned in the film. We have a record number of um, streams and lakes and rivers in Iowa that are impaired. And impaired is a term of art. It means essentially that, there, that humans can have contact through boating or fishing or swimming with those waters without an uh, adverse health consequence. The number of those bodies of water in Iowa is at a record high, was at a record high in 2015. Also, and relatedly in 2015, a record number of beaches were closed in Iowa because of bacterial concerns. And I'll tell you again, as somebody who's lived in Iowa most of my life, and certainly my family has been here for many generations, uh, when I'm thinking about going to the beach, I'm not thinking about going to Grace Lake or Sailorville. I'm thinking about going to Orange County, California, or Orange County, Florida. But for folks with limited socioeconomic issues, going to Grace Lake is as important to them as going uh, to Orange County, uh, Florida is for me. When we close the beaches, we are having a significant recreational and quality of life concern for a number of islands. Record denitrification, we had to remove, because our normal process does not remove nitrate concentrations. We had to turn off those big green things you saw 177 days last year to remove nitrates. Prior record before that in the 25 years we've run them was 109 days. So we're seeing a real exponential break in water quality. Put all that together, we're in the Mississippi River Valley, we're sending more nutrients to the Gulf of Mexico and increasing the size of the dead zone. I lived in New Orleans for a number of years, the dead zone is very real to Louisianians, particularly those who do any shrimping or anything in the Gulf itself. I throw this up as a gee whiz illustration of where we're going in 2016 already, unfortunately. This is an indication of nitrogen loads, a little bit different than concentrations, uh, but gives you an idea of the magnitude of issues we've got going on in the Rackham River already this year. This is for just one month. The months of February and March are similar, uh, but our friends at the University of Iowa haven't allowed us to release those yet. It'll give you an idea of what the environmental breakpoint is that we've gone past now. That is a huge difference uh, from prior years and an alarming difference for folks down in the Gulf of Mexico that are receiving that. You saw the watersheds before, and I've mentioned to you um, that agriculture is a surface water driver of water quality in this state. I want to talk about hydrogeology for a few seconds. Hydrogeology in our area of Iowa, from here up to Minnesota, uh, was driven by glaciation that just happened 15,000 years ago. We have some of the richest soils in the United States from here north because glaciers came down from Canada. Minnesota gave us this wonderful glacial till, but the soils are only 15,000 years old from here north. If you're from Hardin County or Hamilton County or like I am from Story County, you have a pretty good sense of those soils being very different than they are in Pick Clark County or South, Johnson County, Iowa City, Pottawatomie County. They're the best soils, but they have to be drained. They're naturally a swamp. They're naturally prairie potholes. Prairie potholes being a, a descriptor for wet holes that naturally are full 
of both water and microbiological and wildlife activities that we don't see up there because they've been drained. And they've been drained by something called drainage districts. I'll talk a little bit about that. But here are friends, for those of you who may not want to take my word on the contribution of agriculture, uh, agronomists at Iowa State pretty clear that corn and soybeans are really responsible for the nitrate leakage that we see uh, in Iowa. Life's uh, nitrates, nitrogen comes essentially from three sources. Some of it comes from the soils themselves. These are rich soils, and not as rich today as they were 100 years ago. Hopefully they'll be even richer in the next 100 years. But nitrogen also comes from fertilizer, and fertilizer can be in hydrous ammonia, an artificial fertilizer that's put out in the big white tanks sprayed out on farm fields or from animal waste. And here is an indication of the intensity of animal and feeding operations in the, what's called the Des Moines Lobe, our watersheds. Very different here also than it is as we go further to the east in Iowa. Now, I'm going to speak uh, in a couple days in California. And with Californians in particular, I was telling them I'm from Iowa, IOWA. I owe wildlife apology. <laughs> We're from a state that has been denuded. Uh, this is a great map to show that. This was the prairie. Our state was dominated by prairie deforestation along the waterways uh, in the 1850s. It's been massively changed. Now it's road rock. And a lot of it artificially drained, particularly here in north central Iowa. Uh, great contributors to agriculture, not great contributors, unfortunately. This is a drainage tunnel. And for those of you who may not be familiar with the uh, inset photo on the lower left, that's emerging corn coming through beautiful black Des Moines lobe soils just to our north. Uh, so what do you think? The corn is six or eight inches tall, emerging, about the depth of this table as the surface to the bottom of the, of the legs or the floor, there's a tiling system made from this black flexible tile in this situation called pattern tiling that moves the water and the pollutants that filter through that meter of depth laterally into the waters of the state. It's an artificial system necessary to make that uh, worthy of corn, which does not like wet feet, but creating significant flooding problems for us downstream. This is a river town used to be involved in that business, but also very much uh, delivering a quantity of pollutants that's very significant into the waters of the state. This is really the focal point of our lawsuit, that with this kind of plumbing systems comes a responsibility to those downstream. The drainage districts in Iowa, there's a great map. They're all almost in the Des Moines low. I think there's something like 3,800. Statewide 3,200 are in our watersheds because they're necessary to keep that soil tillable and usable for corn and bean production in particular. But again, if you're from another area of, the Iowa, of Iowa, you don't even think of that black tile and its necessity for making the land productive. Wow, is this Mars or is this Iowa? I think it's Iowa. Hardin County, not very far north of us. Talk about altered hydrology. This was taken just a few weeks ago, now about two months ago. You see a landscape that's heavily drained by the culverts coming into a ditch. That is a drainage district. That is a portion of a drainage district with individual farms coming through a private system into a public system. But I think you have a pretty good sense that that affects water quality and quantity in a way that God did not intend in her construction of I'm often asked, why is Des Moines Waterworks doing this? Why aren't people in St. Louis doing it, New Orleans doing it, or Pickett, San Antonio, or Boston, LA? Why are you suing on a water quality issue involving agriculture? The real issue is this hydrogeology that you've just seen a piece of, but this is the intensity of drainage tile systems in the United States. The darker, the more intense. Three areas are intense. Here in central Iowa, which you see on the left, portion of the red-black area, an area that I've also lived in, in beautiful east central Illinois around Champaign, where they have a lot of drainage tiling also when they use groundwater 
to avoid uh, surface water quality problem issues. And the other one that you see over around the Lake Erie, the Great Lakes issue, is around Toledo and Cleveland, where a lot of Ohio uh, farmable land drains to the north and to the east through drainage tile systems in the Lake Erie. I'm on a Lake Erie task force that's trying to bring back water quality, having some success. As an aside, Governor Kasich, uh, very involved in that process. The Ohio Farm Bureau, very involved and very supportive of trying to regulate and improve water quality, a little bit of a contrast to what we see in Iowa, incidentally. Um, but that gives you some sense of why we're unique. We have this unique hydrogeology and unique drainage that exacerbates a real water quality problem. I'm not going to talk a lot about this because we've already hit it in the film. When we go out and grab a pint glass of water that are going to rack in the river, and you look at it, it looks like cappuccino, not like drinking water. Uh, we're able to treat it, get the suspended solids that's the dirt out of it, be able to deal with the microbiological stuff that'll give you uh, quite a shock if you drink that water. Uh, we're able to deal with that through lime softening. The nutrients are far more difficult for us to deal with, and that's driven, again, by what happens upstream from us. There are a number of other things that are kind of important in our world. Uh, fuel oil spills happen every once in a while, but one that's probably worth noting are what are called emerging contaminants, pharmaceuticals. And when I think about antibiotic concerns from a public health standpoint, I don't think about how many antibiotics you take. How many Iowans are there? Three million. How many Iowa hogs are there? 21 million. Which one is the more prolific uh, producer of waste? The hogs. Which one in Iowa do we regulate very carefully about the management of the waste and the treatment of the waste, the human, and let the hogs and the other livestock essentially have a free drop. And we wonder why we've got a water quality problem. Recently, the state is moving towards subsidizing 9 million more hogs and capacities in plants in Mason City and Sioux City. Wow! Think that may change the dynamic uh, less than positively for environmental protection in this state. Nitrate. Give a sense that it's a problem. It's not the only problem we have. And realistically, I'm more concerned 25 years from now about antibiotic issues than I am about nitrate issues. I think the nitrate issues through our litigation or through public pressure probably will be dealt with. Our lawsuit. We have filed a federal clean water citizens action against the drainage districts and boards of supervisors, which are elected county officials in three upstream counties on the Rackham River. Or Northwest. Anybody here from SAC or from Calhoun or one of those counties? Nobody's fessing up to it. Um, some beautiful areas of the state, but there are extraordinary polluters, particularly in nitrate. We bird dogged a number of locations in SAC County in particular for a year and found that they were discharging nitrate levels through their drainage tile systems into the waters of the state four and five times the lawful limit. We view that is a violation of the Clean Water Act, and we filed a suit. That suit is uh, scheduled for trial in Sioux City in August of this year. We also, any lawyers in here? I'm a lawyer. There's a lawyer. All right, we have pendant state claims uh, that have been certified to the Iowa Supreme Court. Now, that's a lot of words for saying part of our issues also are going to be heard in the point, we hope, through uh, state law uh, resolution by the Iowa Supreme Court. All that may or may not happen this year. There's some, been some great register reporting in the last few months, the last few weeks, on um, litigation expense and who's paying and how that's being paid. A lot of money just to prosecute this kind of claim. Realistically, we thought we had no alternative. I face a decision that I ultimately will end up having to recommend to a board that I work for to spend $80 million of your dollars if this is the kind of nitrate problems we're going to continue to see to clean that up so that we can deliver safe water. The kind of litigation expense we're talking about here is minimal compared to $80 million. And realistically, there are larger environmental concerns that agriculture needs to be accountable for if the state is going to continue to be a place that people want to live and work in. And I won't spend a lot of time on this. It's pretty clear, uh, hopefully, to you as you scan it. Um, these are nitrate concentrations on both rivers, and we're able to draw off of the Des Moines River or the Raccoon River. Anything above the origin 
means that the level in those rivers is unsafe. And you're going to see a lot of variation, the variation skewing to the right, except for years like 2008 through 2012. Anybody want to venture a guess why those years were not a problem for us? There were flood years, absolutely. Yeah, I hear drought sometimes. But in my business, we are concerned about concentration. Imagine that I have a glass of water here, a pint glass of water, and right beside it I have a five-gallon bucket of water. If I take a teaspoon of sugar and put a teaspoon in each of those containers, they have different concentrations, right? The five-gallon is going to be very diluted compared to the pint glass, but the loading is the same from a golf hypoxia concern. They're concerned about the loading, not about the concentration. As a water producer, I'm concerned about the concentration. So it's a little turned around in flood years. The amount of sugar, to use the metaphor, that, rig that goes to the Gulf in flood years is very, very high. But as a water producer, I'm concerned about it. Unit per volume, which is actually lower. The more science than you probably wanted. Um, why is there a problem? Part of it is economic. It's a lot cheaper to remove nitrates in the field than at the edge of the field than it is downstream. So numbers you've heard before, we spent a million and a half last year, $80 million to reconstruct it. A lot of science that says in-field and edge of field things, crop rotations, better management of fertilizers, using filters on those tiles that you saw is a lot cheaper way to remove nitrogen than for us to run a unit uh, down here to use uh, uh, an ionization process to remove it. We talked about the dead zone. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I will spend about a minute talking about the Iowa Nutrient Reduction Strategy. Gulf hypoxia is such a serious issue. About 10 years ago, the US EPA said to all of the governors in the Mississippi Valley, what are you going to do uh, to address this? The Iowa Nutrient Reduction Strategy was Iowa's answer to this. Great science. Horrible policy. The science basically says that 90% of the nutrient problem is from unregulated sources, from agriculture. 10% is from cities, sewage treatment systems, manufacturing facilities. What do we regulate in Iowa? The 10%. What do we leave unregulated? The 90%. Hmm. Sound like good public policy? Not to me. Uh, a voluntary strategy, which is what we use in agriculture, essentially tries to convince sent behavior that's going to improve water quality through volunteerism. I don't know about you, but I don't pay my income taxes voluntarily. I'm sure glad my doctor doesn't have a voluntary license. When we deal with public health issues, volunteerism should get set aside. That's a regulatory opportunity and a regulatory requirement. That's where we are with drinking water in the state. Uh, boy, the latest mantra from our friends in the industrial ag they just need more time. They need generations. My goodness, this nutrient reduction strategy, he just gave it to us a few years ago. We've been talking about nitrate concentrations for 25 years. We do not have time. We deliver water to you on a day-to-day -day basis. We're not going to wait generations uh, to get our arms around this. And hence, why are we in litigation? Boy, state legislature now are in the policy issues and spending a lot of time saying, oh my goodness, what are we going to do to come up with a lot of money to deal with water quality? How many of you think that that is not because we filed a federal suit and that if we had not filed a federal suit, they would be talking at this level of intensity? I'm pretty confident there's a causal relationship, even in the social sciences, there. But the problem is they're more interested in coming up with money than they are in solving the problem. USDA has thrown a lot of money at these issues for a long time to increase production and it's caused worse pollution. Just throwing money, throwing sales tax money as an example, most of which is going to be driven from here in Polk County uh, up to producers to do conservation practices without a team to that process is a waste of money. So there's a lot of research that talks about how money has been spent on those kind of programs in the past, and once the money's gone, the conservation practice disappears. These are things that can be done, cover crops. You know, we put all this fertilizer on the land in Iowa to raise crops for six months. What about the other six months? There are things that can use the nitrogen called cover crops in that off season that are pretty important. Crop rotation used to be really important. When I was a kid growing up around farming, 
my family farm, they thought 110 bushels per acre was a really good yield. My cousin, just a few weeks ago, told me that if he doesn't get 200, he's disappointed. Wow. Uh, the soils haven't gotten any better. The process of fertilizing those soils and the genetics has certainly changed, but crop rotation, unfortunately, is where a crop state where corn and corn and corn and corn for a huge number of our acres. That's a problem that has uh, impacts on us downstream. <coughs> Bioreactors are this idea that you can take these watersheds, these sub-watersheds and farm fields and put them through a filter. The filter is essentially a carbon medium like wood chips, as an example, does a pretty good job because of biological activity going on in those wood chips of reducing nitrate concentrations. Other edge of field things like saturated buffers where you take these tiles and before they get to the river or the public waterway, you bring them up to the top of the soil, let the water come out over grassland essentially. These are fertilizers, nitrogen's a fertilizer, so you can fertilize plants before it gets to the water, uh, the surface water of the state or the groundwater of the state, that's a huge advantage. So there are things that can be done, but they're not done. We have 20 4 million acres of tilled land in the state. Cover crops touch maybe 3 to 4% of that, as an example. Iowa State, the agronomists will tell you every acre has to be touched by some conservation practice if we're meaningfully going to reduce nitrate levels and concentrations. For those of you who believe that the hydrology of the state's natural, wow! Nothing very natural about that hydrology. That was a test area for us in Sac City where we found four or five times the lawful level for drinking water production coming out of those culverts. Huge issue for us. There's not another business in this state that can produce, take a pipe from its business to the water in the state and not be regulated. That's exactly where agriculture is today, and it is the huge contributor to our water pollution problems. Our view of water quality solutions are treated at its source, that is, in the field, lots of good measurements uh, that are going to be necessary in a permit just as if it were a stormwater system in a city for each of those pipes and their outlet, at least in the public waterways of the state, and basically agricultural accountability. Ag has to be responsible for what comes off of its land, through its soils, into the waters of the state, just as I would be if I had a paint manufacturer or a water treatment plant, which I have with a permit. Um, I'm regulated on what I can put back in. I would argue I need to be regulated more. They're probably right. Okay, that is kind of a stream of consciousness. 50 minutes or so. Let me try to deal with some questions, sir. So what can we do as urban civilians? What can we do as urban civilians to take the message of environmental protection forward? Can I finish the sentence for you? Is that fair? That's fair. Talk to your legislators, talk to your city council members, talk to your church groups about the need for environmental protection in this state. I mean, we just went through a presidential selection process, and I'll be uh, very surprised if somebody heard something I didn't. I never heard environmental issues raised, and in our gubernatorial races, our, senat our senatorial races, none of that's ever raised. We need to talk about environmental protection in this state, and that can be air quality in some parts of our state, and certainly around animal feeding operations, but talk about that and talk about accountability. Is it fair that people can discharge, oh boy, I'm going to try and see without glasses, which is always an interesting process for me. Is it fair that that can happen in Sac County without regulation? I promise you, if that's in Des Moines, that'll be regulated. There'll be a stormwater permit for that. Is that fair? Is that right? It isn't. The economics don't work and the public policy don't work. It is just, we're discussing kind of a microcosm and certainly it's, it's vital for us as islands to address this, but at the same time, talking on a national level, folks don't want the EPA to regulate anything. Nationally, folks are not excited about regulation. And obviously, regulation is what's necessary, not only here, but on a national level, and there's nothing being done on a national level. No the question. EPA is, is no a question about that. And any word. Let me tag on to that for a minute. Um, you know, regulation has turned into such a dirty word. You know, we think that Ayn Rand is somehow going to run our society. You know, we're going to be without regulations and to do whatever we want, and self-interest will drive us to irrational behavior. 
you know, as people who apparently have an interest in public health, you know better than that. Uh, pharmacists don't volunteer to be regulated and licensed. They decide, and we make that happen. This is a public health issue. This isn't just a reels and rods uh, or gun issue. This is public health. When our water supply, as folks in Flint, I've had the benefit of spending way too much time on that issue with my colleagues uh, from Detroit Water as an example, who are very much involved in that issue. Your water supply goes south on you. That is an economic consequence and a public health consequence. This is not, uh, in my view, a very arguable issue. But we, you're absolutely right. We're pushing against the idea that, oh, regulation is bad. We're going to be non-competitive. You know, agriculture is going to fail. Well, you know, agriculture in California doesn't fail at all, and it's heavily well, and you're to be congratulated for taking the stand because it is absolutely necessary to do this, but it's pushing a big boulder up a hill. Well, you know, and I, and I certainly appreciate that comment. I've been really fortunate to be in Des Moines, Iowa, and able to do that. You know, I worked for five trustees uh, in a political system that we're definitely going against the grain. I mean, I'm pretty tired of seeing myself in a black and white, slow motion TV <laughs> <laughs> That's not exactly what I signed on in, in life. Um, but the reality is, you know, this is a lot bigger issue than Bill Stowe or the one Waterworks or the people in this room. This is an issue that has to be dealt with or it's going to hugely drive economic and public health issues. And Iowa looks foolish for this. I mean, I spend a lot of time in Minnesota and Wisconsin. They laugh at us. And they are good agricultural states just like we are. But they have an ethic that's very much different than ours, certainly. Was at the governor's public health conference today, and he was asked a question. He I told was, him. and uh, I'll paraphrase his answer because the question was essentially, "Governor, we need a mandate. This is not going to happen voluntarily." You're wrong. I'll paraphrase. That was exactly what he said. His That's answer was basically, "Hell no." Yeah, and you know, uh, here's the reality: um, both political parties in the state, Democrat and Republican, are hugely influenced by voters and hugely in influenced by industrial agriculture. From my vantage, Terry Branson is really not a whole lot different than uh, Democratic governors like Governor Vilsack, who's now USDA secretary. I don't think it's a partisan issue. I think it's a power issue. But at some point, we're going to recapture that ground one way or another. We'll either do it through a lawsuit, like we're trying to now, saying that we have a legal right to have these regulated, or we'll do it through economics. You will not want to pay when you're going to have to pay for water if this is the new norm. And you will have to pay that, and you will get tired of that. And you can yell at me all you want, but I'm, I'll just say, hey, folks, that's the science. That's what we have to do. Um, that's a tough corner to turn. And certainly the governor, I will say, to Governor Branstad's uh, defense, not that I'm sure that he would want me to defend him in any way, but he did try um, a pretty different approach this year than he did last year. At least he said his biggest, boldest initiative would be a sales tax issue, which I disagree with, but would raise money for water quality. A year ago, he didn't think there was a water quality problem. So something's changed. I would say we're probably part of that change. But there's been a little change of attitude that I want to give him some credit for. But certainly, if it were up to Terry Branstad, regulating these pipes would not, would not be in the near-term uh, vision for us. I don't think it is in Governor Branstad's uh, bail away Do you anticipate this uh, court case to reach U.S. Supreme Court? Probably. I mean, you know, the, the lawyers will tell you that there have to be appealable grounds and it has to be done on good faith. The reality is that it, I've been told by uh, agri-interest, agri-toxin producers, uh, that if we win at the first level, that they're going to appeal to the Eighth Circuit, the Circuit Court of Appeals. And we've said, you know what, if, we, if you win, we're going to do the same thing. So ultimately, there probably at least is a flight path towards uh, the Supreme Court, whether they would decide to hear it's a different issue. Our issue really is, comes down to this a legal issue. Is this a point source that should be regulated under the Clean Water Act? There are three words in the Clean Water Act that exempt agricultural stormwater discharge. The Farm Bureau argues this is agricultural stormwater discharge. 
It's not, this is agricultural groundwater discharge from a, for a hydrologist. And we have all kinds of expert testimony. They'll say the regulators have looked past that. They should have been regulating this and won't. But could it go to the Supreme Court? Very likely. You know, as a reality, there'll be people who try to ground down our financial resolve to do that. And I think they're going to have a hard time doing that because when we have $80 million in risk out there, we can do a lot of litigating for $80 million. Sir? What are the costs? Has anybody put pencil or papers? You know, you talk about the nitrogen reduction. Right. Right. But for individual farmers, to what extent are they going to be able to do that? For individual farmers to kind of take on the role of uh, the the different things they can do. What sort of costs would it be to individuals? The farmers? nutrient reduction strategy uh, will say that for conservation practices to reduce nitrate pollution down to an acceptable level, um, cut it in half, would cost billions of dollars a year. And that may be, uh, I don't doubt their economic projections. But I would argue that the current system is heading us towards exactly the same outcome, living in an economic wasteland. Um, this is not a sustainable future for Iowa. We've put up with it and encouraged it for 100 years. But the science has changed. We not only have a better idea of what the public health consequences are from this, but the science is polluting the hydrology, the sophistication of plastic pipe, and being able to lay it very easily and the amount of that that's out there in, under Iowa soils is increasing. We're going to have to do something. The economics are real. I don't mean to disparage that. But frankly, uh, a $2 billion a year expense, to me, isn't the issue. I worked um, in the petrochemical business. And when the Clean Air Act came around and said, if you're a point source polluter, U.S. Steel, who I work for, or Royal Dutch Shell Petroleum, who I work for, nobody ran around and said, oh my god, our economy's going to crash, and who should pay for this? Guess who paid for it? U.S. Steel and Royal Dutch Petroleum. The producer should have to pay. If have the economics don't this, work, then they don't work. Have there been discussions about, okay, individual farmers, if you incorporate things like that, then you get tax deductions? Or A I lot of discussions that. like that, and realistically, that's kind of the gnawing on the edges. The USDA has tried for a number of years, you know, we'll incent you to provide cover crops. But the problem is, you still have to make somebody accountable in the long run, because you can't always throw public money at what really is a private producer issue. You can subsidize it at some level, you can encourage it, you can educate towards it, but somebody's got to take control of this. And that control isn't going to be all nice and smiles and you're going to give you a check, because you're paying for that. You've paid for it already. USDA and now a lot of discussion about paying it in sales tax. The sales tax in the state is generated here in Polk County. The producers, a lot of their inputs as manufacturers, quasi manufacturers, are tax exempt. So you're paying the producers again. Does that make sense? Does it make sense to me as a consumer? Bob Riley. Hello, Robert. How are you, Bill? I'm well. Um, I was just up at the state house today trying to sell them on the new plan. The new plan? What is the new plan? Plan E. Uh, I've had A, B, C, and D been thrown in my face. Uh, and this one, uh, to answer your question on the cost, yeah, there's four scenarios of the cost. The one that I think is probably the most doable one, the most reasonable, is a $4 billion cost to get to that nutrient reduction strategy, uh, or dream, whatever they want to call it, uh, by uh, 2030. And that's primarily infrastructure, and then there's a $77 million a year kind of uh, practices and maintenance uh, for that system. And uh, the latest plan that we've got is to have I will, uh, I was born in Land Legacy, be uh, passed as a 3 8 of cent tax, uh, along with a uh, reduction in income tax for the poorest people in Iowa because we have a income tax system that goes all the way down to $13,000 a year, which is amazing to me. Uh, and so that would put enough money into the system along with $1.2 billion worth of individual farmers' uh, contributions into the system to end up with a $4 billion by 2030 to solve the problem, or not solve the problem, to make the, the first big dent in the problem. Uh, all the proposals so far have been sprinkling dollars here and there, hoping that it would go away. And 
Yeah, and I, I will, they just want to come back from my vantage, uh, from a policy standpoint, and unless you fix responsibility, throwing resources ain't going to do it. I don't care how much money you come up with, you throw it upstream and there's no real responsibility over time for who is responsible for what comes out of this pipe. We're spending uh, good money after bad, sorry for the cliche. But that's kind of the public policy dynamic that we are engaged in here in Iowa and we've been engaged at the national level for years. Oh my God, who's, how are we going to get them public money? This is not uh, a public producer. That's a private producer. Ma'am? Is it an over-fertilization problem? It, it isn't that, it, is it an over-fertilization problem is the question. It isn't quite that straightforward. No would be how I would answer it. Uh, the use of nitrogen vital to corn in particular, the problem is that again, we fertilize and are concerned about growth for six months, but for six months, the soil sets there and the nitrogen leaks into our waterways. If you have round year crops, which you can do with cover crops, it'll use that nitrogen more rigorously. Having said that, I'll say that this state also has a very goofy public policy of incenting large uh, fertilizer manufacturers. We're spending billions of dollars to make nitrogen cheaper to encourage uh, abuse and overuse. So, hello, um, even though I say it's really not an over-fertilization uh, problem, we are making nitrogen cheaper to use, which is like making gasoline $2 a gallon and, and sending me to continue to use my SUV when it's $6 a gallon, and I'll probably look at a hybrid. Sir. So if uh, the lawsuit came out in our favor in terms of the court's ruling that this is point, yep. has, to be point has to be regulated, what would happen? So then if farmers, or if someone's monitoring the amount of nitrate coming out of that tile and they find it's too high, who do they go to? The watershed district? The landowners? Who's Great question. A lot of detail yet to be determined. I'll tell you from my experience, having responsibility for the municipal storm sewer system in Des Moines. The first permit out of the box is a narrative permit. It doesn't say, you know, your nitrate level uh, can only be discharged at less than 10 milligrams per liter. But it will say you need to install uh, erosion control, fencing, uh, as an example, may not want to apply nitrogen in the fall when it's really cheap, knowing that most of it will be wasted. Um, there are other non-numeric things that can happen that get you on a plane towards numbers. Ultimately, uh, what are called TMDLs, or total maximum daily loads on watersheds, will drive numeric permits on these just as they drive it for other point source polluters. But that doesn't have to happen overnight. We're not advocating the like you uh, certainly have an appreciation that these systems should go away. They should, they're part of our economy now, but what comes out of it can certainly be regulated. Uh, it can be regulated in a way that ultimately reflects a reasonable cost of production uh, instead of us subsidizing them, which we're doing now. David, wow, David, the, come on up here. You can come on up here. No, no, I'm good. Um, so you, you mentioned a number of other states where apparently the politics works differently. And the politics, the economics, the history, the, the uh, social fabric. I mean, I'm an Iowan. Uh, Farm Bureau is really a powerful force in this state. Why is the Farm Bureau in, in Iowa so different from the Farm Bureau in Ohio? Because there's Cleveland and there's Toledo. I mean, you have a huge... Uh, urban based and suburban based is different and in reality they have a different governor they have reached a reality that Lake Erie is a huge economic driver I can't say that about the Raccoon River maybe we can say it about the Mississippi River but I think there's a scope of economic contribution and a, a historic factor I mean Iowa farmers do not want to be regulated they will go to the wall on that issue I've been dealing with Ohio farmers that think the consequence of rash and harsh regulation is what they face as opposed to a negotiated regulation that they're part of. So very different view of the world. The Lake Erie is like the Chesapeake Bay as an example. Major economic drivers for large populations. 
I can't say that about the Rapid River. Very important to me and to us, but uh, we don't have 40 million people around its shores like you do the Chesapeake Bay in the nine states or whatever it is. One more question, sir. How do we get to the win-win situation here in Iowa? Uh, Iowa is largely dependent on agriculture, and as you just mentioned, it, you try to point responsibility for who <coughs> comes up. But in Ohio, they're at a win-win between right. the environmental, between the agricultural community and the urban centers. Is it not more the recognition of ecological capital, just like the capital that goes into agricultural production of the soil? Don't we need a measurement for ecological capital that takes into account these things? Absolutely, and ecological capital can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Again, I'll, I'll, I'll spend my recreation dollars in Madison, Wisconsin before I will in Des Moines, Iowa. Do we want to change that? Does that make sense? Or St. Paul, Minnesota? There are a lot of things that point towards we're turning a corner. The demographics of this state are turning a corner. I'm pretty confident that I wouldn't be talking here in this tone uh, and we'll say uh, 1996, 20 years ago. And God knows I wouldn't say anything publicly against the Iowa Farm Bureau 10 years ago probably, but the demographic of this state is changing. Most of the people in this state live in eight or nine counties that share the same kind of problems we do here. Ultimately, you know, I'm a great believer that economics drive things. The real point is we've subsidized and distorted the costs associated with corn production. There's an externality that's getting pushed to us that's not recognized in and sustainable food production in the way that it has to be to move us forward. Uh, Win-wins to me, I'm not a labor negotiator by background, so you know, I get negotiations and I get hard negotiations and I get confrontation, table pounding, all those good kinds of things. Many of the same attributes I use today in what I'm doing. Um, there are reasonable accommodations, but there are huge economic interests at stake here and with some folks who are contributing to the Legal Defense Fund on the other side that have no interest in compromise. They accuse us of not being an interest in compromise. I'd love for this to be compromised out in some way that we can see as win win. There's a huge economic stakes here. And it is very different than Wisconsin or Minnesota with huge recreational water use with a whole different ethic and commitment to environmentalism that islands have ever had, unfortunately. Uh, one more, sir. And we go through a great expense as far as to clean the water. What do we do as far as like with the nitrates that we pull out of the water? Yeah, great question. Uh, what we do now is by permit put it back into the river. That may seem a little counterintuitive. I'll try to explain my way through it. But what I'll tell you is we're going to change that and build a hard connection to our sanitary sewer system that will dispose of it through a microbiological process. Nitrogen fertilizer is intended to do you know, a couple things create biomass and plants. We don't raise corn, so we can't take that nitrogen and use it. Uh, we don't have a gazillion acres of corn around the Waterworks Park. The other use is a microbiological use. If you take that nitrogen and feed it to microbes, they'll eat it and gasify it. Uh, our sewage treatment system basically keys on that technology. We key on a chemical filtration process that's why we can't get rid of it. It's in the water cycle for us. It's very difficult uh, to eliminate unless we turn to a microbiological process, which is very different than our core technology, or we raise plants. We're not going to do that. We're going to put it in the sewer system. You'll pay a lot of money to make that happen, too, because we have to go into the Rack and River and pay a special cost. People often ask, and I think it's tangential to your question or implicit in your question, why don't you just remove the nitrates and use that? as a fertilizer, sell it as an example. The process that we use to remove nitrate concentrations uses ionization, valence electrons, God forbid if you can remember your science, the idea of stripping out the nitrate through salt contact. So what we end up with is nitrogen and sodium chloride in a brine. Sodium chloride is not anything you're gonna put, salt is not anything you're gonna put on a plant, so we don't have a good commercial use for what comes out of it. We're gonna change a lot of pieces of the puzzle, but I wanted you to know that we put it back into the river now because our regulators actually require us to do that. Uh, regulation is not the end of the world. 
that hopefully is a message to our farm friends too that some regulation actually lets the business continue to do what the business does. We're going to change that, however, and put it down the sewer system at some significant expense. Thank you for your time. It's a pleasure to see you. Thank you very much. Thank you all.